first off, I would like to apologize <laughs> for making this or having this video get uploaded late for you guys. Um, I was fighting with technology. Let's just say that I'm not the best with technology. <laughs> I recorded this lecture like two or three times every time it got deleted. So I basically had it with technology. So we're going to try again and let's hope that it works today. So before we really dive too much further, um, we need to really think about what the shape of muscles are going to be doing and what the fiber arrangements of those muscles are really going to be telling us. Um, essentially, what we're going to be talking about for the next 20 or so slides is how the specific shape and fiber arrangement of the muscle is actually going to help dictate kind of how much function that muscle is going to have or how much force that muscle is going to be able to produce or the, the speed of either lengthening or speed of contraction that that muscle is really going to be able to have. One of the first major features of muscle fibers that we want to pay attention to is going to be the total cross-sectional diameter of the muscle. There's really there's two different types of cross-sectional area. We're going to have a, a physiological cross-sectional area, and then we're going to have an anatomical cross-sectional area. So if you look over here on the right-hand side, you can see that that anatomical cross-sectional area actually runs the complete width of the muscle group, and that's going to be what's highlighted in the blue. However, that doesn't necessarily take into account some of the tendinous, uh, tendinous sections of that muscle or the muscle belly. In Really, the physiological cross-sectional area, that darker blue area is actually, or that darker blue line, sorry, is actually going to be a more accurate representation of the force production potential of that muscle fiber specifically. So if there is a greater physiological cross-sectional area, then it's more likely that that muscle group is going to be able to create or generate more force. One of the primary reasons, and we'll talk about it later, but really it has to do with these cross section or these um, actin myosin cross bridges that are being created. By adding more muscle fibers or muscle, um, by adding more actin myosin series in parallel and not necessarily in series in length, we can actually increase the force production capability because we're going to in increase the amount of actin and myosin bridges that are being created. And thus, when we go through kind of the ratcheting that occurs with these actin myosin cross bridges and the shortening stroke that's going to occur, we're going to be able to generate more force. There's really two major types of fiber arrangements. We're going to have parallel um, muscle fiber arrangements and we're going to have pennate muscle fiber arrangements. Parallel is exactly what it sounds like. It's going to run, the fibers are going to run parallel for the length of the muscle. It's, it's a little bit of a misnomer because it's not like pennate muscles and the, and the muscle fibers within the pennate muscles are going to run perpendicular to each other. The fibers still stack on top of each other, but it's more has to do with the, the directionality of it as it kind of spans the length of the muscle, if you will. So one of the primary types of parallel muscles are going to be your flat muscles. These are going to be thin, broad, sheet-like muscles that have a broad origin as well as a broad insertion. Perfect example of this is going to be our rectus abdominis. So you can see that there's quite a broad origin. It's actually got, I mean, fairly wide amount of space that that origin is spanning. And then that same thing with the insertion down here on the pubis bone. So it allows the, the force generation potential of that muscle to be spread across a wide area. It's very important for a muscle group such as the rectus abdominis since it largely controls the flexion and extension of the spine or of the, the upper torso towards the, towards the legs. We're going to also have fusiform muscles. A great example of a fusiform muscle is going to be the biceps brachii. And really what you're having is this spindly shape where you're going to have a tendon, a bulbous muscle belly, and then it goes back into the tendon. What's really cool about these fusiform muscles is they kind of direct their force or they direct their insertion on small 
bony processes or small bony targets. So they're able to exert kind of quite a bit of force across a small target area. Great example, like I said earlier, is the biceps brachii and it allows us to actually um, have flexion at the elbow. Another parallel muscle group that is really one of the coolest to look at is gonna be the strap muscles. If you've ever seen like a really, really shredded bodybuilder that's got um, their sartorius is actually visible whenever they flex their quads, it's one of the coolest looking muscles because it actually looks like it's strapping the quadriceps into the leg. Um, these are going to be fairly uniform in diameter. They're going to be all this long muscle fiber that kind of spans quite a distance with targets on small bony points as well. So very similar to the fusiform, but where a fusiform kind of has this bulbous belly, the strap muscles are going to kind of be the same width all the way through. Your radiant muscles are oftentimes going to be your convergent or your fan-shaped muscles. A great example here is going to be the pectoralis major. And if you think about kind of the shape of the pec and how it spans out and how it kind of spreads out and fans out, um, it's going to really be what a, a radiant muscle looks like. So they're going to have broad aponeurosis origins, and then they're going to all converge onto tendons. Don't lie. I know you just laughed. <laughs> the uh, sphincter and circular muscles are another type of parallel muscle. These are technically uh, strap muscles because they're fairly uniform in diameter around, if you will, and you can kind of see that it's fairly uniform in diameter all the way around. These are going to be used for surrounding openings and closing. Two great examples are going to be the, uh, the eye circular muscles, so that exist around the orbitals of the eyes, as well as the circular muscles around the mouth. Pennate muscles, this is where we kind of get into a little bit more fun of muscle groups because they're actually going to be exerting quite a bit more force. These pennate muscles are going to have shorter muscle fibers. Because of the, the way that they run, they're going to actually have shorter muscle fibers and they run obliquely to the tendons. So if we look down here on the right hand side, you can see that the parallel muscle largely runs the entire length from tendon to tendon, tendon to tendon, right? Tendon to tendon. Whereas the pennate muscles have this shorter oblique angle at which they're running, and they increase the cross-sectional area of the muscle because of that, and if we increase the cross-sectional area of the muscle, then we increase the potential for what? We increase the potential for the force, right? There's a couple of different categories of pennate muscles, if you will. We're going to talk about three primary ones, and that's going to be unipennant, uni, uni meaning one, bipennant, meaning two, and then multipennant, meaning anything greater than two. <laughs> so our first up, unipennant muscles, number one, right? These are going to run obliquely from a tendon. So you can see down here on A, it's actually running from one tendon on one side only. You see, if you imagine this dark black line is going to be our tendon, you can see that it's only ever on one side of each tendon. It'll be cleaner when I show you this next slide, I promise. Our bipennant muscles, we're going to have fibers running obliquely on both sides of the tendon. Again, if we take and we track this black line as that tendinous attachment site, you can see that you've got fibers running off both sides, creating almost this leaf-like structure. If we flip back, you can see that those fibers are only on one side, they're unipennant. See how these fibers are running off on both sides of this black line? It's gonna be a bipennant good example of this is rectus femoris. And then lastly, we're going to have our multi-pennate muscles. So that means that they've got more than two pennations. They've got more than two branch points away from tendons. These often occur when the muscle groups have several tendons that kind of run diagonally or across or through the muscle groups. A great example is going to be our deltoid. And you can see over here on the right side that You've got, what well, if you were to just isolate this section right here, it'd be unipennant, but if you look at this tendon, it's bipennant. You look at this tendon here, then you've got some bipennation. These are going to be the bipennant and the, um, the unipennant are going to be the ones that can do, produce the strongest contractions. The, uh, the delts, while they're strong, they might not necessarily produce the most force. 
here you can see a little bit of an example of different muscle fibers and muscle types in the different muscles across the body. Here you can see the multi-pennant muscles of the deltoid. You see how it's it's very feathered in, in many different ways. We have what looks like a almost strap-like running through here. Then we have bipennant, 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 bipennant. If we move over here, we can look at the rectus femoris. You can see that it's kind of it's a bipennant muscle all the way through. The uh, extensor digitorum longus is uh, unipennant because it's only coming off one side. And then you can look to see over here on the tibialis anterior, you actually have parallel fibers. So it's running from tendon to tendon the entire length, right? So now that we got through the, the form of these muscles, let's talk about the role of our muscles. We're gonna primarily have two roles of muscles. We're gonna have agonist muscles and we're gonna have antagonist muscles. Purpose of an agonist muscle is going to actually be the individual muscle or muscle group that is inducing the change of motion through a specified plane of motion. Sounds confusing, but essentially the agonist is going to the is going to be the muscle group that is inducing the joint angle change. So if you think flexion, elbow flexion, the agonist here is going to be the biceps brachii or the biceps or the elbow flexors as a muscle like kind of cohort, if you will. These are typically going to be referred to as prime movers. There is assisters or assistant movers that are also occurring um, and we'll talk about that over the next couple of slides. The other type of muscle group or role of muscles is going to be the antagonists. So if the agonist is actually inducing the movement, then the antagonist is going to be located on the opposite side. So again, if we're going with elbow flexion, since it's the easiest example while I'm sitting here, we've got our agonists as the biceps brachii, and then located on the opposite side of the arm, we're going to have our antagonists or our triceps, right? They're responsible for the opposite concentric action, but then they're also responsible for a, an eccentric action while this is concentrically contracting, right? Because I'm contracting here, this muscle group, the triceps, are going to actually be lengthening. If I had co-contraction or co-concentric contraction, I would essentially be in this like locked state because both muscle groups would be trying to um, shorten against each other. Another predominant role of muscles is going to be to help provide stability or service stabilizer muscles or, or stabilizing muscle groups, if you will. And what these do is they help to surround the entirety of a joint or a body part and they help to either contract to fixate or focalize a, a movement force or they help to sta stabilize an area of a muscle so that a different, they, they focus, they work to stabilize a specific region of the body so that another region of the body can actually change planes. These are oftentimes referred to as fixators as well. So here you can see, as we're working through this, we're going to be going through a motion of shoulder A, B, Duction. So shoulder abduction or abduction is away from the body. So it's going to be moving out in the frontal plane and moving up. Our primary agonist is going to be the deltoid muscles. And why is that going to be our agonist? Because it's the, the muscle group that is actually inducing the movement change, right? So we're going to see that this, this abduction is occurring primarily because the deltoid is concentrically contracting. If we go opposite of that muscle group on the joint, we're going to see that the latissimus dorsi is actually going to be serving as the antagonist. So the as the deltoids contract concentrically, you're gonna have the lats actually elongating and allowing that movement to occur. Whereas if we were having a deduction, that was a forced against a force or a resisted a deduction, the latissimus dorsi would be activated and would be the agonist, whereas the deltoid would be the antagonist. If we start thinking about stabilizers, why is it important to have a stabilizer during shoulder abduction? 
Well, if we did not stabilize the shoulder joint, what would happen when the deltoids contracted? If we didn't fixate the most proximal end of the muscle group to allow the distal end to move, and we instead had contraction across both sides, what would happen? Well, we'd have shoulder elevation and we would also have this abduction that's occurring. And we would either have no net movement or no net displacement, or we wouldn't get as good of a displacement, right? It wouldn't optimize the movement. So here we're actually controlling the position of the shoulder girdle, controlling the position of the humerus inside of that shoulder girdle. And we're gonna actually be using the trapezius muscles to control the more proximal segment of the movement so that the agonist or the deltoids can actually exert its force in a purposeful manner to allow for the abduction to occur. So next week, we're going to get more into the molecular side of the contractions. We're going to be talking actin minus and cross bridges, as well as how we get excitation contraction coupling, or how we actually take and we send the signal from the brain all the way down to our muscles and actually get net movement at the muscle cells.